Thank you everyone for coming out this morning and I hope you'll enjoy what should be a very kind of hands-on practical uh, discussion around asthma management. Uh, hopefully uh, each one of you picked up an audience uh, response system uh, keypad because there are some uh, questions to make this a little bit more interactive and uh, practical. So. Okay, so for today's topics, uh, we'll review uh, use of an asthma management questionnaire um, and how to incorporate that into your clinical practice. Uh, we'll discuss uh, rescue medication dosing and indications, uh, review controller medication uh, indications and uh, dosing, um, and then uh, uh, think about uh, adherence implications of how we prescribe controller medications in particular. Uh, there should be plenty of time for questions, uh, so why don't we get underway? Uh, before I get started, though, um, I did want to learn a little bit about you guys and what your practice is like. So I have uh, about four questions or so here uh, just to understand uh, the audience for today. So um, for most of you at UCLA, I'll, I'll already know this answer, but um, uh, for everyone, oh, people are answering as I, as I ask the question, okay? Um, are, the, are the patient charts in your practice exclusively paper, exclusively electronic, or a combination of both? And I assume since the majority of the audience is here at UCLA, the, the vast majority is uh, exclusively electronic, but we do still have some people with a, a combination. Okay, uh, next question. Okay. All right, how many asthma patients do you see in a typical day in your practice? Less than one per day, one to two per day, three to four per day, five or more per day. Okay. All right. Great. So uh, I think this is helpful to understand. I think the strategies we'll review today um, are relevant regardless of, of the volume. Uh, admittedly, higher volume may make uh, incorporating some of these strategies easier, um, but I would also argue that uh, with a lower volume, these strategies may be even more critical because you're not getting a lot of uh, exposure. Okay. All right. Just a couple questions left. Um, uh, I'm speaking for you. When I see patients with asthma, I use a validated asthma questionnaire, such as the asthma control test, all of the time, most of the time, some of the time, or very little of the time. OK. Great. So maybe I could have those of you who use it all of the time come up and join me at the end, and we can talk about strategies about how you're successfully doing that. I think that's great. and. Uh, that's certainly what I would encourage, and um, uh, we'll try and talk about some ways to make that possible. Uh, for those of you who are not doing it uh, as much, I think this is hopefully an opportunity to reconsider that and think about ways of incorporating this into your practice management. Okay, last, this is uh, more exploratory. Who is this? We've got a pediatric audience, so everyone should know who this is. Right? It's Baymax, right? Has everyone seen Big Hero 6, right? I was really actually intrigued by this concept when I sat down and watched this with my kids. I had no idea what this character actually was about. And being in the healthcare field, it, it resonated with me. So he's a personal healthcare assistant. Was, this is a great idea. Who doesn't need a personal healthcare assistant? Everyone would love to have one of those. So, um, so it, it just got me uh, to wondering. Could a virtual healthcare assistant for each of your patients be helpful to you in managing um, asthma? So obviously not based in any current uh, reality of offerings, but just to kind of think about what are the potentials and how can we um, think about improving uh, care for our patients. So, um, so most of you don't know, and I can understand that. Uh, some of you say yes, and. You know, I guess it all depends on how this would be uh, utilized. But uh, again, I was just curious in terms of what might uh, resonate with you uh, in terms of creative ways or, or alternative ways of improving care for your patients. So why don't we get uh, started with uh, the rest of the talk? So uh, this is a questionnaire that if you come to my asthma clinic, you will fill this out every single time you come in. And I, I think uh, I'll go through each of the questions. Uh, I think it is helpful, I find it helpful because it is a thorough assessment um, that regardless of who you are, 
regardless of education level, regardless of race, regardless of literacy, regardless of socioeconomic status, you will fill out this questionnaire and I will retrieve the same information across every type of patient. And we know that there's a lot of variability in care based on different patient characteristics. So, so the first plug I will make is for standardizing how you assess asthma patients so that you can better guarantee that all your patients are getting uh, good care and, and uh, equal care. So this part of the questionnaire, it's actually two pages, but I'm just showing you this page because this is the bare minimum that I'd suggest using, is um, five questions. And uh, these questions come from NIH asthma guidelines in terms of how we're to assess our asthma patients. So the first question says, over the past week, how many days has your child had asthma symptoms? For example, cough, chest tightness, shortness of breath, and so on. And you see the response options range from zero days in the past week to every day, all day long. You also notice that the response options are color coded. And that's actually to make it easier for you and I to quickly scan their responses and determine if they're problem areas or not. Green responses meaning things are good, and red obviously meaning things are, are the worst. Next, uh, reliever use. Over the past week, how many days have you, to give you, had, have you had to give your child medicine to quickly relieve asthma symptoms? For example, albuterol, inhaler, spray, and so on. And it's the same response options as above. Over the past week, how many days did your child have an asthma attack? For example, when it's harder for your child to breathe, when you have to give your child more medicine, and so on. And that ranges from zero days to four to seven days out of the past week. Activity limitation over the past week, how much has asthma limited your child's activities? And that's from not at all to completely. And then the last question is over the past two weeks, it says how many nights did your child's asthma keep your child from sleeping or wake your child up in the past two weeks? And that ranges from zero nights to eight to 14 nights out of the past week. So let's look at how this would actually work if someone filled this out. So let's say that they uh, reported having symptoms every day, all day long, uh, reported reliever use three to six days out of the past week, had two to three days of asthma attacks, uh, had slight activity limitation due to asthma, and reported one night of sleep disruption over the prior two weeks. We would then classify them at the bottom there. We'll talk about that shortly. In this instance, severe persistent asthma. So you classify literally based on the most severely reported symptom, okay? And this is what the guidelines encourage us to do. So, uh, so that's the, the, uh, the second point with using a questionnaire like this is that you can classify the patient's asthma severity. And to me, this is really the most critical element of seeing your patients with asthma. How can you prescribe therapy if you don't know where they fall on this spectrum of um, uh, ranging from mild intermittent to severe persistent? Each of those have different treatment implications. And without this, I think you'd be stumbling around in the dark. And really, the biggest risk is you underappreciate what's happening with your asthma patient. So I hope you can appreciate that if you are only asking one or two of these questions and not all five of these questions, that there's a great opportunity to miss out on what's happening with your patient. Um, uh, uh, the next point is, and I've touched on this briefly, is that each of these categories have implications for treatment. The goal for everyone is to be mild intermittent, and that's whether they're on treatment or on no treatment at all. If they're not mild intermittent asthma, then there's an issue for us to dress and sort out. Uh, at the very least, it would require an intensification or use of their short-acting or quick reliever medications. And in the instance where they're moderate or severe persistent, then we should be seriously thinking about giving them prednisone. And I think that scenario is very um, uh, common for those of you in the um, office, in the outpatient setting. Many patients that you'll give prednisone will never have to go to the emergency room. That, so if that's the standard that you're using for giving prednisone, you're going to miss out on a large group of patients who would actually benefit uh, from the use of prednisone, uh, who will go home from your office. Um, uh, you're most likely probably to encounter the child who has mild persistent asthma, probably has a URI, is having some coughing, but looks okay. Uh, those patients would benefit from aggressive use of albuterol. So again, there are different implications depending where they fall on this um, uh, severity or control spectrum. Uh, but the main point is, the first step is to collect this information and, and understand what's happening with your patient. 
Now, you may not have time to do this, and I, I don't either. So you may have to think creatively, well, how can we get our patients to complete this? Um, uh, uh, I have my patients fill this out either in the waiting room or in the exam room. So you can try and utilize another person of your healthcare team to provide that questionnaire from them. Maybe it's a nurse, maybe it's a medical assistant, maybe it's a front office person. Um, but um, uh, getting the patients to complete this before they see you admittedly is critical to it being successfully uh, part of your, your practice. So. Um, like I said, I think we'll have time to come back to this at the end, but I'll, I'll move on to a few other topics for today. And this is what I've, I've already said. So, okay. All right. The next portion of the talk will focus really on medication usage. And again, these are the basics, but things that I see incorrectly done quite a bit. So I think it's useful to, to go over this. Uh, before I delve into that, I will say we have these posters in our clinic. They're incredibly helpful. They're helpful actually for everyone. They're helpful for patients to understand what medications they've been on. Uh, they're helpful for me to discuss treatment options with patients. Uh, helpful to explain to patients what medications I would like them to take and why. Um, now, I have a whole bunch of these posters, okay? I have a couple hundred of these posters sitting in my office, okay? So if you want one. I've got 11 by 17, I've got 8.5 by 11, actually it's 22 by 17. Email me and I will happily provide you one, okay? So, um, okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, first, we'll talk about the short-acting bronchodilators. And as you already know, there, there are four options up here, all of which are good options. Uh, the only one I shy away from is the Prevental, and it's only because it does not have a counter. And the counter is the only way to know if your uh, inhaler is empty. And of course, we know about these stories where people have symptoms, they reach for their inhaler and they get no benefit, potentially because there's no medicine in it. And so the only way to know is to have a counter on it. So in terms of uh, prescribing um, for our patients with asthma, um, anytime they're having URI symptoms, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, any of the classic symptoms is the time to initiate this. And I guess what I should say is if they have mild, moderate, or severe persistent asthma based on that questionnaire, that's when you initiate this. Um, I would like to highlight cough. Cough seems to be the most overlooked symptom in asthma. Any number of times from any number of different settings, I, I will hear people report, oh, the patient has no wheezing, um, but they do, not, they do not comment on the coughing. And the coughing is as much a symptom of bronchospasm as the wheezing is. So, if your patient is coughing but their lungs sound clear, they're still having uh, some degree of an asthma exacerbation and, and would probably benefit from use of, of one of these medications. Um, uh, the dosing, many people don't know that there's actually a range of dosing you can use for your albuterol inhalers, and we're not beholden only to using two puffs per treatment. We can actually use anywhere from two to six puffs per dose. And so I encourage patients to titrate up or down their puffs to get the maximal benefit or maximal relief of their symptoms. So ideally, we want them to get relief. In other words, reduction in frequency and intensity of coughing or wheezing or whatever their symptom is for at least three to four hours. And if they're not achieving that time frame, then they should increase the number of puffs they use per dose. Um, this dose range has been studied in a number of pediatric emergency room studies where they compared the inhaler head-to-head -head with nebulized albuterol and actually found that the higher dose range of puffs gave you an equivalent effect as the nebulized albuterol. Um, so uh, I certainly encourage patients to use the nebulizer, but they don't have to. But what we have to offer them is a wider range of dosing to utilize their uh, albuterol. Uh, many parents have uh, noticed this uh, already, and that's what they tell us. They said the nebulizer works better, and I think that's because we're not offering them the higher dose range of albuterol when uh, we're giving them treatment. Uh, and then uh, frequency, four times a day. Uh, so um, uh, historically or classically, many people have worried about kind of abuse or overuse of albuterol. The far more common problem is actually underuse of albuterol. People don't give enough, they don't give it frequently enough. So we should encourage our patients four times a day, not once a day, not twice a day, but really four times a day 
to really maximize the, the benefit of, of the medication. Uh, one strategy that I've become a fan of more and more, uh, particularly as I, I take calls at night, right? You, well, maybe you're not getting the, the call at 10 p.m. at night and the kid has been sick for a couple days um, and uh, the albuterol isn't working, uh, but maybe, maybe you do. Uh, one strategy is to give them a dose every 20 minutes for one, for one hour. Um, and this could be nebulized or it could be their uh, albuterol inhaler. Um, and many times this will be enough to turn things around for the patient and then they can resume their four times a day treatment strategy. And for any of you who've had to take a child to the ER, avoiding an ER visit at all safe, you know, um, uh, possibilities is, is definitely worthwhile. So um, that is a strategy that, uh, that you can consider. Um, by the way, for those of you at UCLA, there is an asthma action plan in EPIC. Uh, that actually incorporates all of these strategies in the action plan. So uh, when you're discharging patients from the hospital, you can pull up this action plan. It's, it's probably about 80% pre-populated. Uh, but again, these strategies are, are in there. Uh, lastly, in terms of how often someone should go through an inhaler, if their asthma is well controlled, ideally an inhaler will last 12 months. That's uh, an awfully long time, and that means uh, very well-controlled asthma. So uh, in terms of thinking about other strategies of understanding how your patient is doing, um, if for whatever reason systematically administering that questionnaire to every single asthma patient every single time is not feasible, well, why don't you just do a count of albuterol refills, okay? And that will tip you off. If it's more than one per year, then you've got to delve in and find out what's happening with that patient and why they're going through more than one inhaler uh, in a year. Okay, all right, and then spaces of course are uh, highly recommended for the use of um, any of these uh, meter dose inhalers, and that is both to reduce the risk of side effects as well as to improve deposition uh, in the airway. And this is regardless of age. So from the NICU to any age patient, um, for these medications, uh, a spacer is, is recommended. Okay, uh, now I'll talk briefly about nebulized bronchodilators, which you're, you're very familiar with. Uh, just a, a few points here. Uh, first is dosing. Uh, so uh, if we look at the guidelines, the dosing, the minimum dosing is about 0.15 milligrams per kilo. Uh, so if we look at uh, patient weight, a, a reasonable cutoff is about 30 kilos. So below 30 kilos, you can give 2.5 milligrams. Above 30 kilo, uh, you can give 5 milligrams. And again, this is to try and um, uh, address and account for the undertreatment or underuse of even albuterol that occurs quite frequently. Okay. Um, second point is concentration, and this is for prescribing. So the 0.083 concentration is really the ideal concentration to prescribe. It comes pre-mixed, it's in a vial. All you have to do is take it and dump it in the, in the nebulizer. Some of the other concentrations, you have to end up buying a separate saline bullet and add it, so you're adding two things. So um, this is simple, but you know something that, that isn't typically covered. And it's a little hard to see, but it says 2.5 milligrams per three mLs. Um, uh, again, in terms of that dose, even Infants, toddlers, all can get 2.5 milligrams, okay? And uh, to that point, in terms of um, uh, leave albuterol or Zopinex, uh, the minimum dose I'd suggest is 1.25 milligrams. It comes in lower strengths. It comes in 0.63 and 0.31. Uh, but those doses are likely to be ineffective even in the very young. And we won't go into it now, but the, the deposition um, in those infants and young children is worse than in bigger kids and adults. Uh, so uh, in a way, giving them the 2.5 milligrams is not, is not overdosing them. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, technique for the nebulized medication, there are two suggested uh, strategies. Mouthpiece is optimal. That's the best deposition in the airway is to use the mouthpiece. If the child is not able to use the mouthpiece, then using a face mask is the next best option. And a blow-by would be uh, completely useless. Um, if you think about that airway deposition with uh, the mouthpiece or the face mask, is probably in the six to 10% range. You can imagine with blow-by, you're effectively getting nothing. So 
uh, I would definitely uh, try and avoid that. Uh, last, in terms of prescribing strategies, uh, we prescribe four boxes of albuterol for our patients. Um, one illness episode will take a patient through a box that's 25 vials that doesn't last very long. So uh, do your patients a favor and just give them enough to have on hand um, when you uh, are prescribing this. And certainly any of the patients who are being discharged from the hospital, at the very least, they should have this number of boxes, but even, even your clinic patients. Okay. All right, now we'll switch to uh, oral corticosteroids. Um, and uh, dosing, but first we have a question, and I've already given you this answer. So, um, at what level of asthma severity should oral corticosteroids be prescribed to patients? And this one, there are technically two right answers, okay? So you've improved your chances to 50%. Okay. Um, question, uh, sorry, um, modern and severe persistent are the correct answers for this. So I, I said there were, there were two answers. Um, uh, and, and that's a general rule. I'm not going to say 100% of the time. There probably could be scenarios where someone with, um, and it should say mild persistent. I'm sorry about that. Number two should say mild persistent. It, it may very well be that uh, someone, uh, you're catching them early in the process and they're experiencing very intensive symptoms. Uh, but when they fill out their survey, it still may uh, only add up to, to mild persistent. But um, uh, really classically what I'm talking about are the patients who fall in the moderate or severe persistent um, category. Okay, so uh, most of you answered um, accordingly. Okay. All right. Okay, so what, is, what does this look like? Again, moderate or severe persistent asthma are these two categories on the right. And just to highlight what we're talking about for what the patient is experiencing under those conditions. Um, they may have any one of the following, and, and so only one of these is necessary, not all of them. They could be having uh, daily coughing uh, every day for the past week. They could be requiring albuterol daily for the past week. Uh, they could be having at least two days of uh, asthma attacks out of the past week. Um, and they're having significant um, uh, activity limitation uh, due to their asthma, either very much or completely. Um, and then a frequent uh, sleep disruption due to their asthma. Um, and to me, it's really these last two, the activity limitation and the sleep disruption, that are the most powerful and most persuasive for me to definitely prescribe systemic steroids for that patient. These are huge quality of life um, uh, uh, situations in which the child cannot kind of um, uh, carry out their normal quality of life. Uh, if you think about children, a good portion of their day is being physically active. So if they're being significantly limited due to their asthma, that is, that is uh, very impactful. Uh, and then the sleep disruption. Um, any of you with parents, uh, I don't need to say anything else, but um, if you have an opportunity to um, uh, uh, change that or, or reduce that, then we should take advantage of that. Um, and certainly there are potential downstream consequences of this degree of sleep disruption, school performance being one and, and certainly others. So, uh, so again, this is a snapshot of what patients look like who would benefit from being prescribed systemic steroids um, in the office, in the ER, um, anywhere actually, urgent care and so on. Okay. I'll just briefly talk about dosing. As you know, there are many different formulations. Uh, I've provided kind of some of the traditional options up here. As many of you know, dexamethasone is, is, uh, has become very popular, particularly in the ED settings. Um, I haven't found it so readily available in the retail pharmacies, so uh, I have not put that up there. Hopefully that will improve in time. As we know, dexamethasone is uh, longer acting, it's better tolerated, and you need fewer doses than traditional prednisone. The one setting where it's not clear yet that it's of any benefit is for patients who've been admitted for asthma. We just don't have that data to prescribe dexamethasone for patients who've been admitted for asthma. Uh, certainly, they're on a different part of the severity spectrum than the patients who routinely come to the emergency department and go home. So I, I think you should be very cautious about using dexamethasone in the admitted um, uh, hospital patient. Uh, otherwise, it is fine in all of the outpatient settings. 
In terms of dosing for um, a prednisone, uh, the minimum dose would be one milligram per kilo per day. And you actually have a range of, of duration to prescribe that anywhere from three to 10 days. Uh, I have seen not infrequently dosing under one milligram per kilo per day. Uh, certainly as part of a taper that might be appropriate, but for initiation of therapy, we should at least uh, 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 aim for one milligram per kilo per day. Uh, you can go higher, up to two milligrams per kilo per day for a maximum of about 60 to 80 milligrams per day. Uh, but we don't have good evidence that two milligrams is better than one. So um, if you're concerned at all about side effects, then one is very safe and effective. Uh, and then the duration of treatment is, is up to you uh, in terms of your perception of the severity of the exacerbation. And of course, it should be used with albuterol or in conjunction with albuterol. And we've talked about this dosing and albuterol four times a day. That's how we will maximize the benefit of uh, treating this exacerbation. So I think we have another question. It says, what is the physiologic relationship between corticosteroids and uh, short-acting beta agonists? One, there's no physiologic relationship. Oral steroids downregulate short-acting beta agonist receptors. Oral steroids upregulate short-acting beta agonist receptors, or short-acting beta agonists downregulate corticosteroid receptors. I guess this was okay. All right. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, I guess people are still voting. So I will. Okay. So actually, um, answer three is the is the correct answer. Okay. And so this is why if we put someone on systemic steroids who has asthma, we should also put them on albuterol. We're missing out on an opportunity for synergy there. Um, so um, that's, that's the takeaway point uh, there. OK. All right. OK. All right. So now let's um, uh, talk about uh, adherence implications of dosing. Um, and then I will also talk about one exception to the need for using uh, inhaled corticosteroids on a, on a daily basis. Okay, so we're now going to talk about uh, this group of, of medications. Uh, so classically, they are used every day, and that's when they're most beneficial. Uh, typical dosing is two puffs twice a day. We'll talk about some alternative dosing strategies uh, shortly. Um, and since they are used to treat airway inflammation, they should be used on a daily basis, typically for a minimum of three months. So having someone on for a couple weeks, then off for a month, back on for a couple weeks, and then off probably is not beneficial. I won't say absolutely it won't be. There are some patients who may benefit over that short time period, um, but uh, uh, that is a much bigger guess in terms of uh, guaranteeing the benefit um, of them, uh, for them with that strategy. Again, I'll talk about one exception to that for a very specific group of patients, but in general, um, this is the strategy that would be used, daily inhaled corticosteroids for at least three months and longer, depending on the, the patient. Um, we may decrease or stop the asthma when it's well controlled for at least three months. So you have a patient come in, you've already diagnosed them with asthma, they've continued to have uncontrolled asthma, you put them on an inhaled steroid, uh, you bring them back, ideally they've responded, their asthma is well controlled, then ideally you maintain that state and that treatment plan for an additional three months. And if they've remained well controlled over that period, then you can start to decrease or discontinue that medication. Uh, I'm probably a little bit hesitant to do that during fall and winter periods since uh, uh, viral infections are a very common trigger. But you know you can take that on a case-by-case -case basis, and, and depending how motivated the family is to, to discontinue the inhaled steroids, you may do it even during those uh, seasonal times when it's, it's more um, risky. OK, so what does well-controlled asthma look like? I guess very simply, all the responses are in the green. So this is not like uncontrolled asthma, where it only takes one. For controlled asthma, you have to have all the responses in the green section, OK? And I just gave one hypothetical example right here um, of what controlled asthma looks like. So this is what you want your patient surveys to look like, ideally, every single time they come into the office to see you. Um, if they are not in, in this situation, then there is some troubleshooting to do. And we'll talk a little bit about troubleshooting later. Okay. All right, so let's talk about once daily options. 
Uh, this is certainly becoming more and more available, and we'll look at some adherence data to hopefully reinforce why this should be uh, the preferred strategy. Um, uh, I don't want to speak for you, but if I think of myself and my family, there's a huge difference between once a day and twice a day in terms of sustained, consistent use. Um, and I think many people are, fall in that, that same boat. Um, so um, I will just highlight uh, the once a day options. Uh, there's um, an Asmonex uh, twist haler, um, Alvesco. Uh, Palmacourt flex haler has certainly been around the longest. Um, and that's certainly a tried and true, and there's good evidence that it's a, as effective once a day as it is twice a day. Um, uh, Asmonex also comes in a meter dose inhaler, which is, has become more recently available, available in a couple of strengths. Um, and I think that um, uh, the Alvesco and Asmonex are nice options for younger kids who aren't able to use the dry powdered inhalers. Uh, I haven't gone into different uh, formulations. I'm happy to later if there are questions around that. Uh, but certainly for your kids, you know, probably under eight years of age, the meter dose inhaler options are, are probably preferred. Um, and then for your kids older than eight, um, uh, your uh, dry powder inhaler options uh, will work. And that's purely from a, an ability to, to do the technique properly uh, to take the medication. Um, uh, newer is um, a new formulation of fluticasone. Uh, traditionally, we've had fluticasone propionate. We now have fluticasone furoate, uh, which is a once-a-day uh, version of Flovent, basically. Uh, comes in two strengths, 100 and 200. Um, it only comes in 30 doses, so you're limited to one puff per day uh, for that. Um, and then we have a once-a-day a combination of inhaled steroid and long-acting beta agonist. Uh, so, as I said, there are more and more once-a-day options that are becoming available for you to prescribe to your patients. Now let's look at some data to show why that may be uh, beneficial. So this was a, a study, and you see the title there, Real-World Effects of Once Versus Greater Daily Inhaled Corticosteroid Dosing on Medication Adherence. So this study looked at a little over 1,300 patients with asthma. They reviewed six years of pharmacy claims data. And they basically compared adherence to those prescribed a once daily option versus twice daily or more. Uh, so as you imagine, the vast majority of people were prescribed a twice daily or more regimen. However, 17% were prescribed a, a once daily regimen. So there was some data to look at. So when they looked at adherence, for those prescribed twice daily or more, the average adherence was 41%. So that translates to three days per week. If they want to look at those who were adherent at least five days per week, so at least 75% adherent, which is the goal we would be striving for, only 17% met that standard when they were prescribed twice a day or more for their inhaled corticosteroids. So for those who were prescribed once a day, the average adherence was 61%, so on average four days per week. And if we look at kind of the, the standard of being at least 75% adherent, 41% met that standard. So um, uh, we won't go into all the nuances here, but if we think about the spectrum of patients, sure, there's some patients who can get away with being non-adherent, but then there's some patients who are definitely going to suffer the consequences of being non-adherent as well. So um, I think we should try and, and put things as a, in as much favor for the patients to remain adherent as possible. Um, whether we're um, uh, adjusting our medications or, or decreasing them or discontinuing them, Ideally, we'd like to know that our patients have been fully adherent so we can correlate the effect that we're seeing with their medication um, uh, taking behavior. Uh, and again, prescribing once a day will um, uh, allow you to be more confident that they actually are being adherent uh, to the medication. Uh, I'm happy to take questions later about how we look at adherence in other ways for the clinician. I didn't include that in this talk because I wanted to focus on some, some specific um, aspects of care, but I'm happy to chat with you more about that. Okay. All right. Now we just got a few questions um, here and then uh, uh, discuss that one exception to daily inhaled corticosteroids. So it says, uh, what is the uh, potential reduction, it should say in final adult height, reported for children who have taken inhaled steroids, and, and you guys are on it. This is, uh, I guess this was, yeah, I'll, I'll hold my comments till people are done making their answer.
Okay. So most of you are aware of the literature and that suggests that the impact on final adult height is one to two centimeters. Um, interestingly, uh, girls seem to be impacted more than boys. So the two centimeter is more likely in the girls and the one centimeter effect is more likely in boys. There's not a good explanation for that. Um, it's hard to say uh, the prevalence of this uh, or incidence of this uh, height reduction effect. Uh, certainly in terms of your patients and this tends to happen in pediatrics in general, but we should be measuring their height every time they come to see us and see that they're growing uh, appropriately on their growth curve. Um, I will say anecdotally, um, I've only had one or two children where this came up even as a consideration. Uh, so in my limited anecdotal experience, it is, it is um, really very, very uncommon uh, that, the, that you see this uh, uh, growth reduction effect. Um, uh, what I see more common is, is patients may not appreciate the, the biological effects at play. Uh, there's one tall parent, one short parent, and they may misattribute the, the stature of their child to the inhaled steroid when it's really more of a question of, of biology. So, okay. Um, all right. Uh, so we'll talk briefly about singular and then one other strategy. There's not much to say here. Um, many of you are already familiar with this. It's an anti-inflammatory, but not a, a, a corticosteroid. Uh, and it, again, it's taken once a day for at least three years, um, uh, sorry, at least three months or, or longer. And then as with inhaled steroids, you can discontinue it when asthma has been well controlled for at least three months. Uh, side effect profile is very good. There, is, there are reports, however, of nightmares and depression. Um, I have seen that, um, particularly in the toddlers with, in terms of the nightmares, depression can be in any um, age range. So again, I would call that very uncommon, uh, but it is, uh, it is possible and certainly something to counsel your patients about. Okay, so uh, a, a last or close to last, we'll talk about this mistrial. And that uh, is a study to address the question of daily versus intermittent use of inhaled corticosteroids. And um, uh, certainly if you've rotated an asthma clinic, this is a study we've, we've referred to or, or discussed um, uh, routinely. So this was a study that enrolled preschool-age children with recurrent URI-related wheezing and a high likelihood of asthma. So they didn't need a formal diagnosis of asthma. And they were randomized either to half a milligram daily of nebulized budesonide, or they were randomized to one milligram twice a day for seven days of nebulized budesonide, okay? And after the seven days, they were off. So they only used that one milligram twice a day at the onset of a URI. All the other times, they were off. And so they compared outcomes between the two groups, and they found similar effectiveness in reducing the risk of exacerbations requiring oral corticosteroids. So I think a very reasonable outcome to look at how effective are these medications. Um, and so in your patients who have exclusively URI-related wheezing or asthma, this seven-day strategy of one milligram twice a day can be effective. And you can get buy-in uh, from parents to utilize this, this strategy. So the key points, again, are the dosing. So uh, historically, uh, for intermittent use of inhaled steroids, much lower doses have been used. Uh, so one milligram twice a day, if we're going to use an evidence-based approach, is what we should be using for nebulized budesonide, and for seven days. So uh, the dosing is the first part. The second part is, in this study, they used a very personalized uh, treatment plan, a written treatment plan. They sat down with each family and said, hey, when is it that Sally or Johnny that you know they're really going to get into trouble? What symptoms are they having? Um, and they link the initiation of the budesonide to the presentation of those symptoms. So these symptoms may vary from person to person, but for each individual, the written treatment plan was, was tailored uh, to that child. So um, uh, this is a, a plug for using written treatment plans. Um, uh, I, uh, again, will refer to myself when we had our first child and my wife and I would go to the pediatrician for even a well child care visit. As soon as we left the office, there was a debate about what he actually said and what we're supposed to do. So I think that is, is normal, um, you know, and if you realize people only retain half of about what you tell them, then having something in writing for them to refer to 
uh, uh, can be very, very helpful. So, okay. All right. I think there's time. Okay. All right. So I think just a couple questions left. Which of the following should always be considered in cases of uncontrolled asthma? Adherence to daily controller medications, inhaler technique, intercurrent illness, underdosing, all of the above. Okay. All right. And it is all of the above. So, of course, we could talk about many different things during this hour, but it's only an hour. But this is your differential diagnosis of when someone's asthma is not well controlled. So they fill out that survey. Uh, it is um, uh, not uh, intermittent. It's one of the others, mild, moderate, or severe persistent, and you want to know why. Well, here's your list of considerations, and this is how you would troubleshoot uh, in the office. Um, what I also should make a plug for, uh, for anyone who comes into the hospital who's admitted for asthma, you should actually go through this differential automatically. You should review their adherence to daily controller medications if they report being on them. You should systematically assess their inhaler technique, and the RTs are more than willing to do that. Obviously, you'll probably be evaluating them for an intercurrent illness, but I would say syst systematically we should be looking for viral respiratory infections. 80% of asthma exacerbations are due to viruses, so if they're getting admitted, we should look for that. Um, and then underdosing of their controller medication. Uh, our goal when the patients are admitted not only is to uh, treat that current exacerbation, but it's to prevent any future exacerbations. We're trying to lower their risk for this occurring again. So sending them out on the same regimen they were on um, is really, uh, I, I think, uh, questionable and, and probably not in, to the best benefit of the patient. Now, if you know they're not taking their prescribed medication, then there's no need to change it. You need to figure out why they're not taking their medication and address those um, non-adherence barriers. Um, but again, this is what we should work through uh, for every patient that's admitted. Um, in part, this is why if you call me for a consult for an asthma patient, I'll ask you to contact the pharmacy to get refill records. Okay, that's the only way we can really get um, a good understanding of the patient's medication taking behavior is to review their, medica uh, review their pharmacy refill data. And it is very easy to get. It's, um, so I'm happy to talk more about that uh, later. Okay, um, I think this is, uh, oh, two more questions. Okay, when should patients with uncontrolled asthma return for follow-up? Okay, the guidelines suggest two to six weeks. Okay, so to put this together, you have them come in, they fill out that questionnaire, they have some level of uncontrolled asthma, you go through your differential, you come up with a solution for that problem, ask them to come back in two to six weeks. We wanna make sure that our intervention has actually worked and that when they show up the next time and fill out that questionnaire, they're back to having intermittent asthma. And that, that is the process, that's the cycle. So. Um, if you want to do that many, many times over, come to Asthma Clinic and we will do it repeatedly, okay? So, um, all right, uh, okay. All right, this is the last question. Uh, what is a reasonable duration of time to see improved asthma control after starting a controller medication? One day, one week, two weeks, one month, or two months? Okay. All right. On average, the data seems to suggest one month, and I could show you kind of multiple slides around this, but I'll, I'll show one slide that I, I think will, will get uh, uh, the message home. So this is from a study, uh, a randomized controlled trial where people were randomized either, the, either to placebo, which is on the bottom, uh, Monty Lucast, which is the, the uh, darkened circles in the middle, or um, beclomethazone, which is a, an inhaled steroid up at the top. And what they looked at on the bottom is time in weeks of the study. And they, the y-axis is the mean change in FEV1 from baseline, so the percent increase in FEV1 from baseline. Um, and so there are uh, uh, two takeaway points from here. 
Uh, first is for both the, the singular and the uh, bechlomethasone uh, group. Uh, you can see that the maximal benefit roughly is in that three to six week uh, period. Uh, and certainly this has been seen in, in other studies as well. Now, since we're talking about groups of people, this is on average to achieve this maximal benefit. So that means for some patients that'll happen sooner and for other patients it'll happen later. But when I'm counseling a patient about initiating either Monte Lucast or an inhaled corticosteroid, I tell them, well, let's give this a month before we decide if this wor is working or not working. Um, the second point is you can see at week 12 that everyone was taken off their, their study drug. And over the subsequent three weeks, there's a loss of that benefit in terms of lung function. So we know what happens frequently. We've put a patient on a medication. They come back uh, for reevaluation at some time period. And they say, Doc, I stopped the medication a couple weeks ago, and Johnny's doing great. Well, that may be OK, but we have this window of probably about three to four weeks before we know whether we're in the clear or not. So again, it's an opportunity to caution them that, well, symptoms may redevelop in the next couple of weeks and that, you know, two weeks is, is good, but that's not a full indication for the child's um, uh, uh, well-being off of, off of treatment. So, um, so that uh, really wraps up my talk uh, for today. So I'm, I'm happy to field any questions. Thank you for your participation and attendance.